you can prob this probably already gives you enough of a definition to understand it. And how from this permutation and understanding how diagrams talk to these permutations immediately allows you to construct a representation of this form. So this representation inside the Grassmannian just comes right out for free as soon as you understand these permutations. And the fact that there's some geometry attached to it is a little bit surprising. And then in the second half of this talk, we'll go in the other direction. I'm going to call it the top-down direction, where we really start from some sort of guess about what these on-shell functions should look like and understand it geometrically and arrive at the same kind of correspondence. And in particular, at the very end, this, this top-down approach, we're going to realize that these on-shell functions that are rep represented like this actually have a Park-Taylor-like form to them. Namely, it's a product of cyclic minors over something. And um, there's a beautiful, the fact that all these connections uh, map into each other is, a, is a quite a beautiful story. But, um, but we have a lot to cover, and uh, so let's get started. So where we left off last time, um, I, this is just to remind you, um, I, for everything today, I'm not going to talk about loop level anything. It's just the tree level part of the recursion. So I'm just going to be talking about graphs like this. And if you remember, I ended the last lecture yesterday by talking about the fact that BCFW gave you different looking formulas for the same expression. Um, the graphs looked very different. And, it, and the fact just doing BCFW in lots of different ways naturally led to some interesting questions. Like, for example, the fact that these three, none of these three functions are the same. Um, and, and none of these three are equal to these three. And the two different representations just differ by rotating all the labels by one, so they seem very close to each other. But the fact is, is that the, you, have a, you have two different three-term expressions for the same amplitude, and they're different. And also, if you actually did this calculation in yourself, pen and paper, you would realize that these, all these functions are basically the same, um, just up to rotated labels. And in fact, knowing this, knowing that the diagrams do not reflect these symmetries very in an obvious way, and that there are many different ways of drawing the same diagram, or different diagrams for the same amplitude, for the same function, um, is probably a really good reason why you shouldn't be drawing these diagrams. And in fact, although the recursion relations were discovered in terms of pictures like this, you'll almost find no physics literature from, from that period of time that drew these pictures and that very quickly went to more abstract um, uh, formulation without these, this underlying picture for a number of reasons, but in part because the diagrams had a lot of redundancy. And it was natural to wonder, how do you characterize the functions associated with these diagrams? Clearly there is equivalence classes. Okay, and let me cut to the chase because we have a lot to cover. And it turns out that there are exactly two generating um, equivalence relations among these diagrams. The first is that a, a chain, a tree of same colored trivalent vertices can be rearranged any way you'd like. And in fact, it's pretty obvious from the on-shell function point of view that, th of, that this sequence of, of vertices implies that all of the lambda tildes going into this vertex are the same or proportional to each other, which it would be the same even if it were, the, were drawn this way, I really should have had it, it's this or this, and therefore allows you to define a four-valent vertex if you'd like. Because um, a, tr a tree of same colored vertices can be, is, can be redrawn in any equivalent way, kind of natu naturally suggests that you draw bipartite graphs to eliminate this redundancy, or this equivalence class, equivalence relation. The much less trivial equivalence relation, however, is this four-particle tree amplitude relation. If you recall from the last lecture, I showed that, that, I mean, doing BCFW in two different ways tells you that this box is equal to this box is equal to the four-particle tree. And this can be generalized into any sub-diagram of a non-shell diagram. And combining these two moves allows you to relate very different looking diagrams through relatively long sequences, often. Um, uh, of these sequences of moves. So what we really care about, if we just care about the function, is the, qu the equivalence class of, of diagrams modulo these two relations. And it turns out that there is a very nice and extremely powerful characteristic of an on-shell diagram that is left invariant under these moves, and so characterizes the equivalence class directly, which is a permutation defined in a very simple way. You might have already guessed it from the pictures that have been drawn here, which is that you start on the outside of the diagram at leg A, say, and you go inward into the diagram, and every time you see a white vertex, you turn left. And so one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. 
Okay, and every time you see a right a blue vertex, you turn right. So here one goes to three, uh, two goes to one, and, and three goes to two. Okay, this is guaranteed to, you start at the outside of the diagram and you go inward and you're guaranteed to go back out the outside of the diagram again. And if you were change all the colors, you reverse all the arrows, so it's easy to see this is a permutation. This is a, uh, a bijective map um, among the external labels. And so you, you, this associates a permutation to the, to the graph. And to see that this um, is, that these moves leave that permutation invariant is fairly obvious, except for maybe this one, which is just an interesting little Anyway, this is the only part that's even semi-non-trivial. Um, okay, now for the purposes of this lecture, oh, let me see if I can clarify this in the precisely correct way. Um, if two diagrams are, uh, if two on-shell functions, um, so any two diagrams that are related by a sequence of moves correspond to the same, define the same on-shell function, um, as so, so clearly, the converse is also true. Um, the, con the converse is also true that if you if you have two different diagrams that define the same on-shell functions and they are related by a sequence of moves, um, that's not quite as strong as saying that that a permutation alone dictates um, uh, the 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 on-shell function for a reason that I'll, we'll see in two slides. But okay, but let's just see for the purpose for the tree-level BCFW, the converse is strictly true, meaning that the uh, two functions are identical if and only if their permutation labels are the same. So remember I claimed that this term, which is one of the terms in BCFW, was equal to this term up to just rotating its labels. So let's just see now that these two have the same permutation labels. Okay, so we start at leg one and we, we turn left at every white vertex and we turn right at every blue vertex. So we go one goes to two, goes out at three. So one goes to three. We can see it on the same side on the other diagram too. One goes to three. Then we look at two. Two goes to five. Three goes to six. Four goes to one. Five goes to two. Six goes to four. So these two functions, if you believe the theorem, I, I, is that these two functions are, are identical. Um, now, for reasons that will become I don't know if it'll become obvious, but, but with a lot of hindsight, I will tell you it is extremely good convention to, to hold on to that, that to just conventionally declare that when you label a permutation, that the image is always greater than or equal to the starting point. So instead of saying four goes to one and five goes to two, I'm gonna add six to it. So that way it's gonna be the, uh, the same permutation mod six. So I'm gonna say that four goes to seven. I always want something to go with something greater than itself. Um, this is kind of a triviality here, but it turns out to be an, a very useful bit of the general technology. Okay, now if you believe me that 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 two permutations, um, uh, that two graphs that have the same permutation uniquely characterize the same function, then this is an amazing th thing. It means that you can now translate BCFW, the, especially the, the, the tree ampl the tree amplitude version. I'll leave this as an exercise to to take that diagrammatic picture. Put the, imagine it as an operation on permutation labels, and it immediately gives you a recursion directly in permutation labels that invariantly characterizes every function that comes out of it. Um, and so this allows you to basically forget about the diagrams. Well, you might be a little scared because how are you going to reconstruct these functions if you don't know anything about them? So, so because uh, this is this is kind of the hope. If if n equals four is truly combinatorial, I should be able to email you a function by just giving you a list of permutations and you should be able to reconstruct it yourself. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in the next couple slides. Um, but the, the point I was mentioning before about this little, the, the question about the um, converse of the, of the equivalence between permutations is related to reducibility of the diagrams. Some of you might be thinking there's that the, the moves that we, the equivalence classes we talked, I just showed you, leave the number of faces, the number of loops of these diagrams invariant. Um, and so, but clearly there's an infinite number of, of, of diagrams you can draw with arbitrarily high numbers of, of loops. So what's going on here? There's a finite number of permutations, but there's an infinite number of, of, of graphs. And the answer is that there's a, a quasi-equivalence. It's not truly equivalence, um, which is uh, related to a, a bubble deletion. So the idea is that if you see a diagram, if somewhere in the diagram you have a, a bubble like this, this thing 
is almost the same. This on-shell function is almost the same as this on-shell function. In fact, we can define the left-hand side to be the BCFW bridge on the right-hand side. From that, you immediately know that it's just some d alpha over alpha times the right-hand side function. But this move, which is a semi-equivalence, so it's telling you that the on-shell function on the right, the left is equal to the on-shell function on the right times d alpha over alpha, kind of a trivial prefactor. Um, but this move, this reduction, does actually change the permutation. So all the strict converses about, about uniqueness usually require that we're talking about reduced diagrams, ones that are free of bubbles. So this gives you a, uh, and, and the class, the statement that there's a finite number of on-shell functions is really that there's a finite number of reduced functions, and then there's an infinite tower of, of d log wedged on those functions that you might need. And in fact, these are extremely useful if we cared about loop integrals, which I'm not going to have very much time to talk about. So um, for the rest of this talk, I'm only going to be drawing and talking about reduced diagrams. Um, okay, we'll come back to that in the next lecture at least at a definitional level. Okay, so recall that, that we had one useful operation for building a planar, a pl not just planar, but any diagrams, a more complicated diagrams out of simpler ones, which was to take some on-shell function and to attach to it a BCFW bridge like this. And a beautiful thing is that, is that this has a very simple oper uh, in action on the permutation that labels the graph. Um, all it does is it just transposes the uh, images. And the only requirement that, that this bridge needs to happen is that, that the, this new edge needs to leave the graph planar. Um, clearly the permutation requires that the graph be not only planar but have a plane embedding. Um, okay. So that's just kind of a cute observation, but it becomes an incredibly powerful computational tool when you realize it can be read not from left to right but from right to left. You see, what it means is that if, I, if you just knew the permutation label of some function, that it would be equal to a simpler function without, a, without the bridge. And that simpler function would be labeled by a, a permutation that was just related by a transposition. And this allows us to take some permutation label for a graph and successively delete BCFW bridges into, until we get to something utterly trivial. And this allows us to recursively um, so this is like BCFW recursion, it's not at all, it's, I'm going to call it decomposition, um, allows us to recursively define a representative of this on-shell function given its permutation label alone. So let me show you how this works in practice. Um, and um, of course, what I'm going to outline here is one method among many because there's a many ways of decomposing a permutation into adjacent transpositions. But let me just give you a specific set of rules for the sake of concreteness. Suppose that I emailed you this, this permutation and you didn't know what the picture looked like and you didn't know what the function looked like. How would you go about reconstructing it? So the function that I have in mind looks something like this. You know, it's some black box and one comes in and it comes back out at three and two goes in and comes back out at five, et cetera. And you don't know what this thing is. Well. What we're going to do is we're going to always write the permutation as the first pair of uh, a bridge attached to the first legs whose images are ordered, um, skipping over anything that's self-identified, um, should become useful. So we can see that the first pair of ordered images is one and two. So I can write this, this thing as a bridge between legs one and two on some graph that's labeled by that permutation. Okay. And our function that we care about is some d alpha over alpha times some simpler function. All right, can anybody tell me what the next one, the next bridge should be? So the first pair of images that's ordered. Anyone? Legs two and three. So there we can swap them, swap the images, and we now get, notice that three is now mapped to itself. For all intents and purposes, it's not even attached to the diagram, so we can ignore it from here on out. Okay, now we can attach another, uh, uh, remove a, or have a bridge between legs one and two again. So we get this, and we can keep going. And we'll keep following this procedure until we stop because we eventually encounter a permutation that's the identity. And so we have this, the function we care about, we've now just generated a representative graph, by the way, which is kind of cute. And we have, um, which by the way is a proof that there is always a graph that's labeled, that, that is labeled by any permutation. So given any permutation, this is a construction of a graph 
that's labeled by it. But for a physicist here, we care about the fact that the function that I had in mind is now just a sequence of bridges on something that should be semi-trivial, this F8 that's labeled by that. Now, this F8 is part of the reason why I like this convention of having um, something go to, its, go to something greater than or equal to itself, because now we can see that this identity permutation is, has some sort of decoration. See, like three goes to itself, but one goes to seven. Well, what is, this, what is this graph, this F8, this bottom thing that's supposed to be trivial? It's this graph without any of the bridges. So I just, we just delete all the bridges. And we're going to look, we land on a pretty unusual looking on shell function. We didn't encounter it last time, in part because it was just a little singular. But I want to, but it's easy enough to give this a definition. So an on shell function where all of the edges just terminate means that it is imposing the constraints that all the momentum flowing into the graph is zero, okay? Which is a very kind of trivial on-shell function, but it's a nice one. And the, the colors that are left, which is equivalent to whether or not the thing goes to itself or itself plus n, tells you whether or not it's the lambda that's vanishing or the lambda tilde that vanishes for this configuration. So this on-shell function here where, where one, two, and four go to themselves plus n, you set those lambda tildes to zero and you set the lambdas of 3, 5, and 6 to 0. This is the on-shell function. Okay, now notice a few things because we're, this will be recurring. First is that notice that the number of delta functions here never changes. Actually, BCFW bridge, we talked about it last time, never changed the number of delta functions. It changed the number of integrations, but not the number of delta functions. And so here we have two delta functions per particle, exactly 2n. That's never going to change when we add bridges. Um, the second thing, which is, which is just kind of sneaky, but it's such a, this is really where, you, where the Grassmannian comes about, is that this set of delta functions is nicely encoded by a matrix. One way to say that all of these, that, that lambda tildes of particles 1, 2, and 4 are 0, is to dot it into this matrix. 1, 2, and 4 dot into lambda tilde tells you that lambda tilde 1, lambda tilde 2, and lambda tilde 4 are 0. And this matrix has an orthogonal complement, which has ones in columns three, five, and six, and that tells you that those lambdas are equal to zero. So this on-shell function can be written in a form that looks a little suggestive, um, like this. Okay, and importantly, this form absolutely never changes. It doesn't get affected by BCFW bridges. And although we didn't derive it in this form, um, it's, it's kind of an easy exercise that when you add a bridge between two legs and you shift lambdas according to the way we derived last time, and also that Uten talked about last time, how you shift the lambdas and lambda tildes upon adding a bridge, has a simple interpretation. That an active change in terms of lambda can be, lambda can be turned into, uh, or lambda tilde can be turned into a path uh, leaving lambda tilde fixed and changing C. So in particular, um, adding a bridge between columns 4 and 6 has the effect from, it's white-black, it's oriented, so having white in 4 to black in, in 6 has the effect of shifting column 6 by some parameter proportional to, to column 4. So here we go, we had column 6 was 0, and we're going to shift it by alpha 8 times column 4. There we go, and there is our new on-shell function. Pretty trivial. Notice the number of delta functions did not change. How many are there? There's two times six. There's 12. Okay. Now I add another bridge. We shift column four by column two. We shift column five by column four, and we keep going. Okay. And now we have some weird looking function. This still doesn't look anything like the on-shell functions I talked about last time, but I promise you it's actually, it is actually, um, well, we have not, well, the alphas are a little unusual, but this is exactly in that form. The easiest way to see that, perhaps, is to notice that the number of delta functions here, it's 12, um, and four of those always encode overall momentum conservation. So we have eight extra delta functions beyond momentum conservation to talk about, and now we have C depends on eight parameters. And that means that just like in, we saw in the last lecture, in Song's lecture, um, this is the, the integral over these alphas is not really an integral at all. It is, it is the solution to the equation c dot lambda tilde equals zero and lambda dot c perp equals zero. 
Um, this is, these are eight delta functions with eight unknowns, and that trades these alphas to their solutions, which depend on the lambdas and lambda tildes. And so when you solve those delta functions, this whole matrix becomes a matrix of lambdas and lambda tildes, and this thing becomes one over the solution. So it's a very simple, um, the product of all the solutions. So this is a nice representative. And up to the s a sign that I would love to talk to you about during a break, because I definitely don't have time to talk about it here, this uniquely characterizes that on-shell function um, just in terms of this permutation, and it's constructive. Now, I wish, um, well, yeah, I'm going to have, I don't actually have much to say about positivity per se, except for to notice, or at least I'm going to skip over most of this, but I would just like to point out. So you look at this, this, this configuration, and you'll notice that, that one minor is zero for trivial reasons. Minor one, two, three is zero, just because you can see the th zeros in the bottom row. And it just happens to be true that every other minor of this matrix is, a, is expressed as a sum of positive monomials in the alphas. So this is a, if the alphas are real, this describes a so-called positive three by six matrix because um, all the ordered minors of this matrix are positive. And if you remember from high school algebra, or geometry maybe, uh, the, a 3 by 3 determinant encodes the area of a tri uh, the triangle on the projective plane. And that means that if all of these, th uh, these uh, 3 by 3 minors are positive or zero, in the case of one th 1, 2, 3, that the configuration is convex in P2. And in fact, we can bring it back up to a generic configuration by adding one more bridge on the top, and we'll get a generic configuration. And because for positive real alphas, this is describing a convex hexagon in, in the, on the projective plane. And deleting bridges has this nice interpretation geometrically, which um, I would talk about more here, but I have a, we're going to talk about in greater detail towards the end. So I'm going to kind of skip over this. But it's just kind of, but it's worth pointing out that this has some sort of positive geometry hiding behind it, but you know, we didn't derive it from any pos constraints about positivity. I don't care if the lambdas are even real, they can be complex. I don't care if the alphas are real. The, uh, nothing about the measure depended on reality or positivity or anything like that. Um, okay, and why don't I very <laughs> imagine you didn't see that because we're going to derive this later. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that on general grounds, if we take any on-shell diagram, we can actually decompose the diagram into a sequence of bridges, which is always possible in the planar case for reduced diagrams, but it doesn't matter. From the permutation, we can construct iteratively a sequence of bridges that connects it down to something trivial. And through that process, we never change the number of delta functions. There's always two delta functions per particle. So here we have 2 times k plus 2 times n minus k, which is equal to 2n. And of those, four of those delta functions always encode overall momentum conservation. And so this, there's always 2n minus 4 net delta functions here. Um, and so a diagram with 2n minus 4 bridges corresponds to some sort of rational function. And this is, going, this is true for all the terms in tree-level BCFW in this formalism. One interesting thing that I don't have enough time to talk about very much is, is it's such a triviality here, but it has uh, it, ha it plays a big role in the um, in the amplitudes and our understanding of amplitudes, and especially in the f framework of in, in the context of integrability, which is that there's, an, there's that these functions obviously have an infinite dimensional symmetry. Why? Because we can do any volume preserving diffeomorphism on the alphas, and that diffeomorphism, which is an active change in the C alpha, can be traded for a leaving C fixed and doing an active transformation of the lambdas via these delta functions. And that means that a, that a diffeomorphism in these coordinates can be, can, can be tra traded for an active transformation of the kinematical data. And that means that, there are, that, there's an in, that there, for every diffeomorphism that leaves this volume invariant, there is an active transformation of the data that leaves the function invariant. That means that this thing has an infinite dimensional symmetry. That's a very surprising fact. It turns out that this is the Yangian. And in, in the planar case, it's actually very easy to identify the symmetries that leave all diagrams invariant, and therefore, which, in, which proves that it's a function of, of, uh, of an amplitude. Because all we need to do is embed every diagram inside the top dimensional diagram. Oh, that I guess that'll be clear in the next part, half the talk. But, but the point is, is, that, is that we can, everything can be viewed as a sub-diagram of some parent diagram, and we just need to ask the question, what are the diffeomorphisms that leave that volume form invariant? And that immediately implies that it leaves all 
sub, all daughters invariant as well. And that turns out to be the Yangian. Okay. So, I'm about halfway done, and this is the end of the bottom, what I'm, what I'm calling the bottom-up connection. The idea that we didn't we really know, even know about Grassmannians, we just started these on-shell functions and, and decided to write them recursively in terms of bridges, and, um, and that we kind of discovered some K by N matrix along the way. In the second half, in the, in the remaining part of this talk, I'm going to go in the other direction and kind of start from a top-down, a, a, a general idea of what an amplitude might look like, and we'll see that, and that this forces us to think about some sort of Grassmannian geometry, and that we lead to exactly the same kind of combinatorial structure. In fact, it informs us a little bit more, because we didn't, the picture I've described so far is not quite general enough. It just gives you an algorithm. It doesn't give you a global picture. Okay. But before I get to the, I guess, the second one, I want to give you a half of another, another way that you might have discovered some Grassmannian geometry just by thinking about um, this Park-Taylor amplitude and thinking about it geometrically. So consider like just the four-particle amplitude, but we could have done this for any n. The point is that, it's, that it has the product of these cyclic minors, and this has an interesting geometric structure. Um, so we can view, these are, these are elements of the Grassmannian of two planes in four dimensions, but we could, we could make it two planes in n dimensions. And for the sake of right now, let's just consider these to be real. It doesn't really matter, but P1 has a nice interpretation when it's real. RP1 is just a circle. And that means that if, that, that if we take the lambdas to be real, valued, then them being projective immediately tells you that these are points on a circle. And that means that they're ordered. No matter what points you pick on a circle, there is a natural ordering to them. And when they are ordered, all of these minors, so if the points on the circle are ordered uh, in the natural way, then all of these minors happen to be positive. So a positive configuration in RP1 is kind of, is there's all, any points in G2N is positive with respect to some ordering, as long as it's uh, the real Grassmannian of two planes and n dimensions. So, but now this is a four dimensional space. It's two times four minus GL2, so it's just two by two. So it's, it, this is a four dimensional space. And we're looking at the configurations here. Now, it's, it's a natural question to wonder what is the stratification of boundaries of this function, of all the kinds of singularities that you might encounter along the way. So for example, so in the bulk, it's a little hard to uh, visualize four dimensions, but the three-dimensional boundaries are pretty easy to see. So there are four co-dimension one boundaries corresponding to setting this minor to zero, that minor, that minor, that minor. And they're attached to certain diagrams as well, and we can see that there are two of them that are kind of connected like this, and two of them that are connected like this. So there are four three-dimensional boundaries. One top dimension, four three-dimensional boundaries. And now we can start inspecting the two-dimensional boundaries of the boundaries, and we can see that there are two special kinds of three-dimensional, of two-dimensional boundaries that join these pairs of three-dimensional ones. And then there are these eight um, uh, two-dimensional boundaries along this, the faces here. And here the picture, the, the, the meaning of these pictures is that is let me see here. So this is two, three, four means that two, three, four are projectively identical to each other. Okay, they're the same point in P1. Um, so that's why it's two points there. Anyway, that's the meaning of these little symbols here. And you'll see that there are there are so there are four codimension one boundaries, there are ten codimension two boundaries, two plus eight, and then we can look at all the codimension three, the one-dimensional configurations, etc. And we start drawing this this nice structure. And in particular, if you were to draw the graph of all this, these, these covering relations, you would discover some interesting things. That, for example, this is um, a combinatorially a polytope, meaning that it, it satisfies an Eulerian POSEC condition. And it means that every single face is, top, is topologically a ball. And in fact, in this case, you can prove that it's diffeomorphic to a ball. So this region, this open region of defined by these, this positive configuration and ordered configurations of points on a circle corresponds to a ball. And in fact, you won't be surprised to know that this whole story, um, in fact, a little Googling would have led us to it much earlier. Um, ge Grassmannian ge geometry and Grassmannians and generalization of the dialogue. There's an interesting kind of correspondence there. And I think this is from 1982. This is the figure from that paper, where they basically did this whole analysis. And it has a very natural generalization to G2N, um, because again, G2N, you always have some sort of ordering, no matter how the points are configured. <coughs> 
Okay, so we're already starting to see that there's some sort of geometric structure here um, behind the scenes, or at least related to these functions. Okay. All right, now let's start really the top-down derivation. So the starting point here is kind of a quixotic or maybe a, an optimistic guess for what an amplitude should look like. And what I'm about to tell you is actually closer to the actual history for how this, at least the physicists discovered this correspondence. Um, it was discovered, it was known independently by mathematicians like Alex Posnikov, who we'll be talking tomorrow for other reasons. Um, but to physicists, what I'm about to tell you now is more or less our historic trajectory to this, these ideas. So you can, uh, approximately, again, I'm rewriting history to suit my purposes. Um, so, okay, so this is the Park-Taylor amplitude. And it's a function of some Grassmannian, this two plane in n dimensions. And these are all the cyclic minors of it. And from Uton's lecture, well, we know that the, the two in the MHV tells, it has something to do with the number, the number of etas, this, this fermionic component up here, which tells you, you know, that there are two negative helicity particles. And this condition tells you that these two pair, this pair of two planes have to be orthogonal. If we wanted to generalize this to say m negative helicity particles, m minuses instead of just two minuses, simple considerations of supersymmetry tell you that this thing has to be generalized not to a two by four delta functions, but a m by four delta functions. Four is counting the number of components of the eta tildes, the two is counting the fact that this is a two by n matrix. So if we wanted to upgrade this to a, some m, uh, n to the m minus 2 MHV amplitude, or something like this, we would have to introduce some sort of generalization of lambda, okay? So this is kind of the only form we could do, and simple considerations of weights dictate that you have, that these, all these 2 by 2 minors have to be upgraded to something like um, m by m minors. Okay. Now, in order for momentum conservation to be implied by these constraints, we must have that C contains lambda. Um, in fact, it would have been natural to call C capital lambda or something like that, because it contains lambda, but then talking about big lambda and little lambda would have just confused everybody. So I call it, calling it C instead. And we, so we must have that C contains lambda, and that can be imposed by another, well, uh, the delta functions at C, that lambda is orthogonal to the orthogonal complement of C, which is a long way of saying that C contains lambda. Lambda is orthogonal to C perp, okay? So C contains lambda. And now this is starting to look familiar from at least the first half of this lecture. The number of delta functions, if you trade m with k, starts looking familiar. This denominator looks pretty unfamiliar. Um, but this structure starts looking nice. So we go to the first non-MHV or parity conjugate of an MHV amplitude, the six particle m equals three, so the three to three process. Um, and see what this thing looks like, and what you know whether or not this 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 equality has any meaning, any possible meaning here. So what if so m equals six, three and n equals six? We have this kind of form. Okay, is there any kind of possibility for that? Well, one thing that's kind of obviously wrong that we can notice immediately is that the number of delta functions again it's twelve delta functions, four of which encode momentum conservation. So there's only eight constraints. How big is this space? Well. It's three times six minus GL three minus three squared, so it's nine dimensional space. So the, the C's, there are nine degrees of freedom in the C's, but we only have eight constraints, eight delta functions we can possibly impose. Which means that this formula can't really be, it can't mean anything as stated. We need to somehow do something with this last parameter. It's eight plus one. There's one extra degree of freedom that we have to do something to. Okay. Let's actually, let's, let's try to identify that, the, that last parameter as, as simply as we can. We can pose all six of these delta functions by just putting lambdas in the top two rows. So if C contains lambda, we can surely pick a uh, representative matrix where they're just literally the top two rows of this matrix. Okay, and now we're left over with the constraints that this bottom row is orthogonal to lambda tilde. Okay, and it's, I will spare you the effort that there are two, there's a one parameter family of solutions to those. Um, but if, however we decide to write this bottom row as a function of one last degree of freedom, so call it tau, 
this thing is what we get is that every one of these minors now becomes a function of this last degree of freedom. And in the tau plane, there are places, there are six places where there are poles. There's a place where minor one vanishes, where this matrix takes this kind of form, and it turns into a configuration like this, where one, two, and three are, are collinear, are, are along the same line, that this triangle vanishes. Um, and there's some residue there. There's also a place where two, three, four equals zero. I'm going to call it minor two. And at each one of these points, there is a unique solution to the, to the constraints that the bottom row is orthogonal to lambda tilde. Well, let's look at one example in detail. So here, at this residue, when 1, 2, 3 equals 0, this is the form of the matrix. And we, I, I claim that, this, that there's a unique solution to these three Cs orthogonal to lambda perp. And in fact, we saw it in the last lecture, at least briefly, which is that this is the unique uh, solution to those, those those equations. So this is the, this is the a matrix representative of this residue. Now what does the function look like on this residue? So this is on the residue 1. This is what C looks like. What is the res what's the formula? Well here it's actually relatively easy to compute and I'm, and I'm kind of happy about this because it's a ni much nicer way of deriving this formula than what, than what we saw yesterday. But I mean, but it's kind of a trick, the fact that I chose a, ga a representative matrix where everything is easy. There's no Jacobians. So for example, what the function is, it is just all of the other factors in the denominator evaluated on this matrix. So in particular, minor 2, 3, 4 is this 3 by 3 determinant, which is angle bracket 2, 3 times square bracket 5, 6. Okay. Now this 3 by 3 determinant is just, it's a sum of two things, and it has some angle square bracket, which I think was mentioned before, or might have been written with xx's. Anyway, this is some Mandelstam, S456, etc. And this gives you the function, in fact. And in fact, there's no prefactor here. This is exactly the right function. Um, now, if we wanted to pick out a particular component, this is something I hope, if, if any of you had time to read the, the note for the tutorial today, it would be useful for you to know that these fermionic delta functions are not so scary. All this means is that you're supposed to take k four k by k determinants of this matrix and multiply them in the numerator. And if you want to get a gluonic component, you take the same minor four times. And so, for example, if we wanted the minus helicity gluons to be 2, 4, and 6 out of the super function, we would just take this and we would we'd pick out this component of this fermionic delta function, which is just taking minor 2, 4, 6 to the fourth power. So we just take, and we can compute that, that's what it is, and this is the, amp, the component for minus, 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 there. And it turns out that this is exactly that function that we would have computed in the first half of the lecture from the bridge construction. Um, and I will leave that as an exercise, um, but if you solve all those alphas in terms of lambdas, this is the solution that you get. Um, and it, yeah. Sorry, what is R? Oh, R rotates all the indices. Uh -huh. so, if, so this is just one of the functions, and I remember from the first half that the amplitude is just one function plus its rotation plus its rotation. So this is the amplitude there. And now we actually have a nice geometric understanding of this identity. Remember that these three terms were equal to these three terms. It's now just Cauchy's theorem on this plane. And in fact, this is going to persist. All of the identities that we need among on shell functions are encoded by, by residue theorems in this, uh, Cauchy's theorem, really, um, among this, these kinds of on shell diagrams um, uh, understood in this kind of way, including that all the trees equal trees. So we see that these three functions are equal to these four, three functions up to a sign. Okay. Okay. So this naturally led, so, so there we, I think we've established, at least this example shows or suggests, that there is some sort of definite sense in which this, I can remove the, the question mark and say that there is a contour, there is a choice of contour of this form that gives you the right answer. And so it leads to a natural guess, and this was the, the content of the, uh, the, the, the real punchline of the, of the first paper in physics about this Grassmannian correspondence uh, w by Ar Arkani Ahmed, Cachazo, Kaplan, and Chung, where they proposed that, they, that a formula like this must exist, and they were a little vague about what the contour should be. Um, um, but I think we now have some evidence for it. So this was the form that we was a kind of initially guessed, that there should be some sort of con set of residues of this form that brought you down into rational functions, that those should be corresponding to on-shell functions. Okay, it's called LNM or LNK. Um, and the, the, the conjecture was that the, these residues are in one-to-one -one correspondence with on-shell functions. 
But there were some kind of trivial questions that, that, um, that we spent quite a long time thinking about. And uh, like, for example, what are the possible contours of integration? Clearly there's m, or there's, sorry, there are n. Um, there are n factors in the denominator, so there are n co-dimension 1 residues. But after that, these minors are, are, k th are mth degree polynomials in the entries of the matrix. And so you can, you, things start to factorize. It kind of, kind of becomes a mess. So it's natural to wonder, like, what are the possible contours? How do you name them, et cetera? And how, do you, um, how are they identified with on-shell diagrams? This was un unclear. And what relations do they satisfy? How do you generate the C? How do you get an engine that gives you all these identities? OK. Um, and we could have learned the answer to all of these questions if we had known about Alex Alexander Posnikov before we did. Um, but it turns out that at least from the physics point of view, we learned most of this through a very productive um, series of lectures and discussions with, um, with some of the mathematicians at the Institute for Advanced Study. And in particular, um, the answers to these questions were, at least I learned about the answers to these questions from, from Pierre Deligne, who uh, basically worked it out over the weekend and was very happy to explain it. So the idea is that I want to we want to classify the contours of this thing. Whatever it is, it has to be GLK invariant, because we're talking about things in the Grassmannian. And so this has got to be talk, uh, like ranks of minors, ranks. Ranks are GLK invariant, so ranks. And, and it's pretty clear that from this from the denominator that the only kinds of residues you could possibly encounter involve consecutive constraints. So for example, we can say that the columns 1 through m are, are linearly dependent, but we can't say that 1, 1, 3, 5, 7, et cetera, are linearly de dependent. That's not a co-dimension 1 boundary. But we can say that a consecutive group is linearly dependent. And then we can keep uh, imposing consecutive constraints. And so Deligne suggested a, um, an interesting and extremely redundant way of categorizing any such residue that you might imagine. Um, extremely redundant, but very illuminating. Um, we'll lose the redundancy in just a moment. The idea was, let's just decide to tabulate all of the ranks of consecutive chains of columns. So we're going to say A dot dot up to B means the rank of the space spanned by these consecutive group of columns. Um, and we're going to organize this, this data in a kind of clever way. We're going to write 1 to 1. This is just the rank of column 1. So it's 0 if column 1 is 0, and it's 1 if it's not. And we're going to write it in the rows here, 1 up to everything. And then we're going to, along the diagonal, we're going to write 2, 2, et cetera. So that, that in each column, we have a fixed starting point, and in each row, we have a fixed end point. Okay? This is, turns out to be a useful way of organizing this data. And it's worth pointing out that we can actually extend this in arbitrary directions. Even though 1 through n looks like it's maximal, why not? We can keep wrapping around n without any difficulty. We can keep going higher. It doesn't cost us anything. In fact, we can, with cyclic symmetry, we can keep translating this, this, this thing up and you know, along the diagonal here. But of course, if it's a full rank matrix, this thing, ha all, there'll have to be a lot of k's around there. This is now a k by n matrix instead of an m by n matrix. It's a little easier for me to pronounce or uh, distinguish. OK, so for any generic configuration, this thing, there have to be a lot of k's up here. It's also clear that this, the bot this diagonal has, is, bound, is either 0 or 1. And in fact, we can start defining things below the diagonal if we'd like. Say that the chain from A to A minus 1, which is an empty chain, let's just declare that to be rank 0. Um, you know, this is an empty chain. And so we have zeros along this diagonal. And it's very easy to see that, that this table of data is monotonically increasing this way. And it's monotonically increasing from right to left. So that means that you have zeros down along this diagonal, and you increase up here, and you increase this way. This is a very interesting class of data. And the way Deline described it, you know, you look, at, you, you look at this table once in one example, and you will know everything. And I hope I can convince you in the next slide that this is true. So let's look at this in one example and see if we can understand everything. So imagine a generic configuration, uh, a 4 by 8 matrix. And we're going to uh, imagine, we're going to draw them as points in P3 just for the sake of drawing them. So we just have some config, these are just points in three dimensions, projective, projectively. Okay. And so there's some, there's just some, in just some sort of generic configuration. And if we draw that table of data, we see that every, every column has rank one, every chain of length two has rank two. So we have this thing. And 
I can't imagine any of us can look at this, this uh, table of data and see and understand the numbers, so let me color it so we can kind of, so we can understand what's going on here. So it's a very simple kind of table, and this is what you get with a generic configuration. Okay, but we can start imposing consecutive constraints. Like for example, we can say that 6, 7, 8, 1 are l less than full rank, so they go to rank 3. So we can put 8 onto, onto this plane, and we see that this, r this table changed a little bit, okay? Um, because the, the chain from 6 to 1 dropped from four, rank 4 down to rank 3. We can move po 3 onto this plane. We can move 5 onto the plane 4, 5, 6, 7. We can move 2 to the plane 6, 7, 8, 1. Okay, we start, and this table of data changes as we go. We can put 5 on the plane 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, we can put 3 on the line 2 to 4. Two, four, and we can put eight down here. Anyway, every time we, we can just look at the sequence of constraints and see how this table evolves, and we, start, we can start noticing a few patterns, um, which once you notice the pattern, you can easily erase the example and prove everything on first principles. Okay, so the first point is that this entire table of data is very, I mean, it's obviously redundant, but it's actually redundant in a very beautiful way. Namely, um, it's entirely dictated by these corners. If you know where the corners are, you know the whole table. Because it's monotonically increasing from bottom to top and from right to left, all you need to know is where these divisors, are, these divisions are between the, the groups of ranks. And that's dictated by these corners. And there's exactly one corner per column and one corner per row. Interestingly, that encodes a permutation. So this table of data is entirely characterized by this permutation, which um, we're going to now shift our column labels and our thing labels here and say, okay, so this, we've also deleted the numbers. You can reconstruct that from this permutation. So, so this entire table, I hope I've convinced you, is completely dictated by these red dots. And that means that this configuration can be labeled by a permutation. One goes to five, two goes to four, three goes to eight, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, I've put, you know, I've, instead of continuing this diagonally forever, I've just kind of cut it off at n, so it, okay. Anyway, so this permutation label uniquely tells you all of the ranks, which gives you complete GLK invariant data for this configuration. Um, at least all of the consecutive constraints you could possibly have. And the geometric meaning of this interpretation is actually kind of, it's, it's beautiful on its own, which is that for every column A, there's a unique nearest neighbor above greater than A, such that A is spanned by the set A plus 1 up to B. So let's see how that works. So 1, it's not spanned by column 2 because it's not proportional to 2. So it's not inside the span of column 2. It's not along the line 2, 3. It's not along the line 2, 3, 4. But it is on the plane 2, 3, 4, 5. And therefore, 1 goes to 5. Okay? And 2 is not, sp it's not spanned by column 3 alone, but it is spanned by the line 3, 4, so 2 goes to 4. Okay, etc. And um, it's easy for you to prove that this is an actual permutation, that this defines a permutation. You can go in the other direction as well. And so this is the nice interpretation here. Now, this turns out to actually be a very valuable tool that we did not have from our analysis in the first half of this le lecture, which is that now we understand we can really understand the entire geometry of these configurations. Um, it's so-called positroid stratification because we understand now dimensionality on general grounds. See, what is the dimension of a configuration here? Well, it's actually very easy to, to understand because I, we said that one is spanned by column, by the, by the space two, three, four, five. One is inside that span. And what is the rank of that, of that chain, two, three, four, five? It's three. It's the color green up there, okay? which is counted by the number of crossings in this, per, in this diagram. So there are three rank increases along this, this thing from one to five. So, we, uh, so it requires three degrees of freedom to specify what one is. It takes two degrees of freedom to specify two, four degrees of freedom to specify three, etc. And so the, the, the number of intersections of this diagram counts the dimension of the configuration. It tells you exactly how many degrees of freedom you need to specify every single column of the matrix. Except, of course, we uh, didn't, ac this is over counting a bit because there's an obvious, there's always a GLK redundancy here. And so the dimension is the sum of these ranks, the ranks of A to sigma A minus the GLK, the dimension of GLK. 
This tells you exactly what the number of degrees of freedom you need to specify um, the configuration exactly. And it's counted by the number of dots, the number of hooks, the crossings here, uh, minus k squared, um, which is very nice. <clears throat> okay, and now that we understand, and I will leave it as an exercise for you to to recast this statement into a purely combinatorial statement. You can see that, you know, the, the number, the rank of A to sigma A is equal to the number of B's below A such that the image of B is, that sigma B is between A and sigma A, something like that. So you can easily code this up in Mathematica you'd like if you just given the permutation. Okay. Now this allows us to immediately talk about the boundary configurations in a very clean way, which is that a boundary configuration is any one related to this one by deleting a dot, basically. And how does a dot get deleted? So, it's, it's this, so the boundary of a configuration is, the set, is labeled by the permutations that, such that the reduced one has a lower dimension. Dimension drops by one, exactly one. So inside this diagram, if I had two a to sigma A and B to sigma B, if I just transposed A and B, I would delete that intersection and I would drop the dimension by one. And this dimension drop by one is, okay, it is, is perfectly fine if there was another hook that went over here, right? So it still went two crossings to one crossing. I could have had a hook this way and it's one, still two crossing to one crossing, or I could have had both, that's okay too. The one thing that is absolutely forbidden is you can't have a hook here. You can't have something in between here because this takes three inner crossings and it drops the dimension by three, okay? So there's one forbidden configuration, which means that the boundaries, you can now describe the, the permutation labels of a boundary at least um, ter purely combinatorially, which is that it's a set of all permutations related by a transposition such that there are no paths from between A and B to between sigma of A and sigma of B. And of course, A, B, sigma A and sigma B have to be ordered like this um, to do this. Now you can take a permutation, an arbitrary permutation, and you can construct all of its boundaries and then construct all of their boundaries and all of their boundaries and you can keep going down to a zero dimensional configuration and I will leave it as an exercise. It's actually not that hard to prove that this boundary up, that this boundary covering relation squares to zero. It's an appropriate kind of covering relation. Um, and um, and it's a much less trivial proof um, that, that, this, that this always defines an Eulerian post set. For any permutation, you get an Eulerian post set um, of uh, boundary configurations. Okay. Now, the, the, the last thing I'm gonna kind of, I'll, I'll leave you with is that, and I'm not sure if I really have enough time to really nail it home, but the point, this example allows us to prove uh, some pretty interesting things. For example, that the permutation that labels this geometry is identical to the permutation that would label the diagram um, who, that would be computed in terms of this auxiliary matrix with this geometry. And the, 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 all of this gets proved recursively by just considering how a bridge acts on these configurations. See, just as we did for the, the diagram, we can take this geometry and we can start decomposing it by adjacent transpositions the way we did. So we can say that the first ordered pair is between two and three. And when we do that, when we uh, imposing this transposition, we're going to trade this hook with that hook and we're gonna delete that red dot, gets deleted, okay? So we drop in dimension by one, and now two, three and four are proportional to each other, okay? Um, uh, which is, e okay. And we can just keep going, and so we can do the exact same so sort of, uh, the exact same sort of adjacent, what we call the lexicographical bridge decomposition for the permutation, has this nice interpretation geometrically. And all you need to prove, th to prove the statement that I made is that, is that this configuration is labeled, which is labeled by this permutation, would be also the, the uh, label, the on-shell diagram corresponding to this permutation, which is just an empty diagram with some white and, bl and blue vertices, depending on whether something goes to itself or itself plus n, that that, that, that on-shell diagram, which has this matrix, and labeled by the same permutation, and then when you add a bridge, the, um, the matrix changes in the same way that the, the, the left-right path permutation changes. And now you know that the, that the same exact permutation labels label everything. And so you can basically delete all the diagrams and you can even delete the geometry if you'd like. Um, everything is now purely a combinatorial exercise. Um, but there is a lot of beautiful geometry. Okay, 
so I'm about out of time, but I want to just kind of summarize this. So we have an on-shell diagram. There are, there's a huge equivalence class of on-shell diagrams, but this equivalence class uh, is uniquely character, a representative of this class is uniquely characterized by just the permutation, which is obtained by starting at leg at an out outside leg and turning right at every blue vertex and left at every white vertex. We'll land you somewhere out. Nine goes to three. Oh, sorry, yeah, nine goes to three, which is 12 mod nine. Um, and from this, we can construct, we can do a sequence of bridges to construct this auxiliary matrix in which this function is given this form, okay? Um, and this function is actually fully characterized by that permutation alone because I gave you an algorithm to construct the function given that permutation alone. But what's amazing is that if you just looked at this kind of span of columns of this matrix, that this geometry, which corresponds to some sort of weird configuration like this, where eight, nine, one, two, three are all on a plane, et cetera, um, this kind of configuration would be characterized by exactly the same permutation. And in fact, we can view this geometry as being a restriction of this form on the Grassmannian, which is a top dimensional form on the Grassmannian of the product of cyclic minors, and that residue of this form would be labeled by the same permutation. So this thing, this is a particular representative coordinate chart for the residue, a particular residue that's also labeled by the same permutation. Okay, now in the next lecture I'm going to talk about non-planar and we're going to do something a little bit more global, um, which is to construct this correspondence between on-shell diagrams and, and graphs kind of without respect to a planar embedding or permutations. We're going to lose the combinatorics, but we're going to keep the geometry. Um, and so this is kind of the end, at least for my lectures, about the planar, uh, uh, planar on-shell diagrams. But Alex Postnikov will have a lot more to say, and I'm, I imagine Nima will too, uh, on Thursday and Friday. But because this is kind of the last point, I should tell you that there's a lot more details about all the story can be found in this book that you should all own a copy of, um, uh, written with some really great uh, collaborators, where, I th where these these examples I've discussed and a lot more can be, uh, are found in a great, in great detail. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice lecture. Uh, questions for Jamie? Yeah. Yes. yeah. I'm assuming uh, when you draw all these colored lines for these diagrams, uh, it reminds me of uh, Gerard Troop's double line formalism for gluon propagators. Uh, is, th is that a point of inspiration for drawing up all this? I mean, I know the context is very different. Well, it's not especially different. I mean, the, the point of that paper is that there's a nice uh, planar expansion. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this thing is like, um, of course, a different context altogether, but uh, was uh, that double line formalism anyway relevant? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, the double line formalism actually gives you a, uh, a ribbon graph that's planar. Yeah. And here, you know, it's, it's actually very important um, to this. You know, this is just a pretty picture, but it, is, it does illustrate some points. Um, the lines cross on every yeah. edge that has uh, black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that, that the, uh, you know, we, I, we just ended by seeing that all the boundaries of a given permutation, well, if a boundary exists between, you know, the, the that changes the images of column A and column B, then that means that, there, that there's a path from, from, from leg A to leg B that crosses on some edge. And that boundary corresponds to deleting that edge of the graph. Um, so it's very important that these things cross each other. But uh, I, yeah, I don't know. We, I didn't really put in, there's, there's no uh, structure constants here. But yeah. yeah. Uh, we have time maybe for one more short question. Okay, well then let's uh, thank Jake again. Yeah, thank you. And a great lunch. <laughs>